Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated by my Patreon backers. This week is the 19th anniversary of WCW Starcade 1998 from December 27th at the MCI Center in Washington, D.C. This is nominated by Adam Vanderplum. Adam, thanks so much for nominating this show. Kind of interesting that Starcade 97 seems to be the obvious choice for this month because it's the 20th anniversary of that show and it was considered the company's most successful pay-per-view. Not necessarily their best, but definitely their most successful one. But oddly enough, no no Patreon backers nominated 97, so 98 it is, basically. A very interesting time in WCW at this point. You know, Hollywood Hogan had recently retired from wrestling, lol, to pursue a presidential campaign, double lol, although we laugh, but at the same time, if he had ran today to try to be president for the next term, for 2020, I think he'd probably have a 50-50 shot of like getting the nomination, to be perfectly honest. Scott Steiner is the new leader of the NWO Black and White. They're still feuding with the NWO Wolf Pack, and yeah, things are changing around here. Kevin Nash is the head booker of WCW this time, you get this feeling that the landscape in WCW might be changing, but really, this show would ultimately precede what would go down as one of the biggest blunders of the Monday Night War, one that would permanently turn the tide in favor of the WWF. So, there's that. Tony Schiavone, Bobby Heenan, and Mike Tenay are on commentary for this show. They start things off by saying that this main event of Goldberg and Kevin Nash for the title is the biggest world title match we've ever witnessed, and somehow I find that kind of hard to believe, but that's the way they're building this thing. Uh, it is kind of, it's, it's funny to watch these old WCW shows, because that was the format they used to do. Pretty much from the beginning of WCW right till the end, every pay-per-view and every Nitro for that matter would always start off with the announcers kind of breaking down what you'd see on the shows. It is very similar to you know the way you see if you watch a football game today. It always goes to the announcers first and they kind of break down what you're going to see in this game before the gameplay actually begins. Today's wrestling, if you watch like, on WWE for example, it's like boom right into the action or right into the first promo. You never really hear the announcers break down what you're going to see in this show until after the first moments. So it is kind of a cool throwback for to look watch these old WCW shows to see that. It is charming in a sense, but also they talk a really long time breaking down the card. It gets to the point where, okay, we want to see some action. Although, after all this talking at the beginning of the show, what's the first thing we go to? Do we go to a match? Do we go to a promo? No, we go to a commercial for WCW's QVC special. I guarantee this ain't gonna be no jewelry show. After that, then a plug by Gene Oakland for the hotline. We then go to our first official match, finally, a triangle match for the Cruiserweight Championship as Billy Kidman defends against Rey Mysterio Jr. and Juventud Guerrera. Uh, uh, Guerrera is the official LWO representative here for the Latino World Order, I should say. It's an offshoot that was started by Eddie Guerrero as kind of a way to fight the system, all these Mexican guys banding together to fight the man. Uh, Guerrero, like I said, is the official rep for the group. Mysterio is technically part of the group at this point still, but not for long. And at this point, the attentions are there but very much there between he and Guerrero. Guerrero thinks that Mysterio is looking out for himself, not in the interest of the group at large. It eventually leads to Mysterio officially leaving the group and then the LWO eventually dissolving. Uh, really watching this match is a lot of fun. It's a great throwback to just all that classic cruiserweight style that all three of these guys really were made famous for and helped put on the map in WCW. Just a lot of really awesome fast-paced moves, flying attacks, springboard moves, moves off the shoulders. Hoobie hits a Frankensteiner on Ray off of Kidman's shoulders. And it's just an incredible move. Uh, Frankenstein Steiner to the outside off the apron by Ray onto Hoovy. Absolutely nuts. Uh, throughout the whole match, there's lots of pinfall breakups. I don't think there's a clean kick out in this entire matchup because every time there's a pinfall, the third guy is always the one to break it up. And it does get kind of repetitive after a while. I guess it's a way to protect everybody. That, oh, you know, no one has to try and like kick out of the big moves. It's like someone else is trying to save it and break the break the pin up. But it does get repetitive because there are like at least a couple of dozen pinfall attempts in this matchup. And they're always broken up by somebody else. Uh, the big high point in the match for me is when uh, Kidman has as Mysterio and Guerrero on the outside, hits them with a top rope shooting star press from the top rope to the outside. Oh my God, brilliant stuff. Again, stuff you won't find anywhere else but with the cruiserweights at this point in the game. At that point, Eddie Guerrero, the leader of the LWO, makes his way to ringside. The referee is distracted and Guerrero tries to use that opportunity to cost Kidman the match, putting Hoovy on top of Kidman. But then right after that, Ray ends up countering that. He puts Kidman on top of Hoovy and that results in a three count. Kidman retains the championship after a wild opener. I'm gonna give this one three stars out of four. It was a terrific display of cruiserweight action by some of the best the company ever saw, but we're not done yet because immediately following this, Eddie Guerrero's in the ring on the microphone berating Guerrero and Mysterio, saying he couldn't get the job done, I gotta do it myself. So he calls out Kidman to a title match for later, and then Kidman responds and says, no, we're doing it right now. He calls Guerrero's bluff and they have the championship match right then and there. So we go from one cruiserweight title match to the other, Guerrero versus Kidman. And this is not a really short match that follows up the big one we just saw. This is another full 
full length match, like pay per view quality. The match starts off with like nice wrestling moves between both guys, but eventually uh, breaks down into a brawl. Pretty much the opposite of the beautiful flying maneuvers we saw in the very previous match. There are some points when the referee is distracted and Eddie's trying to, you know, use the ropes for leverage for a uh, submission hold on Kidman. But at that point, Eddie took off one of his work boots from a couple minutes ago and like used it to hit Kidman and threw out of the ring. So Mysterio has the boot and he would occasionally like when, when Eddie's cheating grabbing the ropes, Mysterio would take the boot and like hit Guerrero in the hand and then he kind of hide under the apron. At this point, Eddie's bodyguard, I had to look at who it was. His name is Spider or Art Flores. He doesn't really have, I can't find much information on him. So he was just there. He's distracting the referee. Well, that's going on. Eddie capitalizes and tries and pull off a superplex. But then Ray pushes Eddie off of the top rope and into Hoovy, who's on the apron. So they all take a spill. Kidman hits another shooting star press and wins the match. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars. Not as pretty as the opening match, but still very much exciting. And seriously, how do they not push Kidman to the moon after this? Like, literally, I think it was that they held him down because of his size, because he's a beast here. The fact that he went like over a half hour wrestling three different guys in two separate matches, and they weren't carbon copies. And again, I would have forgiven them if the second match were just like a quick move and a roll up and that was it, where Kidman gets the, the jump and he manages to, to win uh, by the skin of his teeth. But this was like a full-fledged pay-per-view quality match, and he wrestled back to back with limited problems, it seems. And like the announcers put over that he had like a hurt shoulder and stuff. I don't know how much truth there was to that, but if so, even then, in major props to Kidman. Like, why wouldn't you push him after something like this? This is like a star-making performance. Probably one of the biggest career highlights for Kidman is this back-to-back -back duty he did at Star K98. Great stuff. Our next matchup, the artist currently known as Prince Iakea taking on Norman Smiley, or as they like to be called, Norman Smiley. That was a constant theme in the commentary here for this matchup. Uh, speaking of which, the announcers don't spend a lot of time talking about the match. They're pretty much focused entirely on discussion about Flair Bischoff later on, and then Goldberg and Nash. Like, almost no attention is being spent toward this actual match, which is actually really good. Like, Iakea has a style, it's a very big contrast of styles. Iakea does a lot of strikes and quick attacks, while Norman's more ground-based, more submission-based. European style, a lot of the like, big slams. That's kind of Smiley style compared to Prince Iakea. The fans, you know, are loving the Norman Smile, the big wiggle that he does. That was like his big thing that got him super over. Even though his style wasn't like that flashy, he had the wiggle and fans loved it. The fans do start to get restless as this match goes on. Like, as things goes on and like the match is reaching its crescendo, you hear the fans starting to like boo and groan and stuff. And I don't know if it's something else going on, on the outside or something off camera, but yeah, I mean, this match was good. It was fine. And so Norman fights to get the chicken wing, or it's called the Norman Conquest, locked in. He takes Iakea down, gets him kind of like a rear naked choke while he's doing the, the chicken wing. Iakea taps out. I'm going to give this match two stars out of four. Despite what the crowd may have thought by the end when they were starting to boo, I think this is a very good match. You know, I don't really know how much heat there was to it, but it was a very well, uh, hard fought match. Good styles, good good work between the two guys. I had no complaints. We get a promo from Scott Hall. He makes his way down to the ring in his street gear, and just all it did was remind me of Starcade 97 when he comes out in a very similar manner to say that Kevin Nash won't be wrestling tonight because he didn't want to put the guy over. Anyway, he comes out here. It's been 98 was a very rough year for Scott Hall personally. He had been divorced from his wife uh, due to his his substance abuse issues. They would later remarry about a year later, but then divorce a couple years later after that. So yeah, very rough year. And storyline wise, Hall was like the lone wolf at this point. He he had kind of like distanced himself from Kevin Nash and the NWO Wolf Pack. In this promo, it's actually a pretty strong promo here. He says it was a tough year for him, but he doesn't have to prove anything to Kevin Nash or nothing to the fans. He has to prove things to himself. And so 99 will be his year, which unfortunately does not turn out to be true. Then he walks off. And that you think that's the last we see of Hall tonight. Spoiler alert, it won't be. But yeah, pretty strong promo by Scott Hall here. Our next matchup, Ernest the Cat Miller, the three-time World Karate Champion, takes on Saturn in singles action. This is Ernest Miller before he starts getting over with his James Brown affectations that he would impersonate and later become his gimmick. Like, he got super over when he started doing the James Brown stuff, but by this point, he was just Ernest Miller, and he was, like, the cocky, very arrogant karate fighter with a little bit of flair to him, but still, like, you know, that's pretty much all he had going was his talking ability. He was very arrogant promo at the start of the match. He gives Saturn the count of five to forfeit, but he turns around, eats a punch, and the match begins. Saturn is pretty dominant in this match for the most part, although he goes for a top rope axe handle and the cat dodges and a nice kick to Saturn in the head. Uh, Ernest starts working Saturn over, the, the match ends when Sonny Ono, who's Ernest Miller's manager here, and the originator of the selfie, by the way, that's a very important point, he wants to kick Saturn, even though the referee's like, no, don't do it. Although, honestly, what was still later this night, it makes me seem that he probably could have done it and got away with it, too. So Saturn dodges the kick, and Ono does this nice, very big jumping karate kick. He hits Miller in the chest, but Miller totally no-sells it, which makes me think, if, if Ernest Miller no-sells it, what the hell is Saturn going to do if he got hit with the kick? So anyway, <laughs> Saturn hits the Death Valley driver onto Ernest Miller for the win. Pretty 
basic match. I wasn't really into this one. I'm going to give it one star out of four. We go to the top of the ramp to see Gene Oakland welcome Ric Flair down for a promo. This is a big deal for WCW fans because we hadn't seen Flair at two Starcades before this. He wasn't there for Starcade 97 or for Starcade 96. So for him to be back here for his grudge match with Bischoff was a pretty big deal. This is, of course, I loved how he would start every promo off in WCW. He would always go, Me! This is my first real exposure to Flair was when I started watching like 98. So uh, to see him not do that anymore as time went on, he wouldn't like refer to Jim Ross that way or Michael Cole when he was in WWE later on after the uh, invasion. So yeah, I didn't really have much context for why he did that for me and Gene. Very passionate promo by Flair here. He's cutting one on Bischoff saying, you know what we do to punks like you back in the day? We would, you know, beat your ass and hit you in the you know what's. We have a very passionate promo here. We then get a really good video package explaining why these two are fighting and what began this grudge. And really, it's actually living out some of the best real life moments and reasons this feud is happening. I'll tell you that a little bit more as we get to the match. But yeah, I think it's a really does a really good job showing Eric Bischoff's you know rise to prominence from announcer to being you know the, the head of the NWO and the foundation of the New World Order from the beginning. He was always there lurking in the shadows, and now he's just a power hungry, maniacal president. He's firing the referee Mickey J. He like insults his children, and then like he beats up has like Flair's kids get beat up. He makes out with Flair's wife forcefully. Just all this skeezy stuff and Flair getting so mad about it. And then I love this one point in the build like Flair like says in a promo, Bischoff you have no heart, which of course is the perfect time for him to have a mild heart attack in the middle of the ring. Like you couldn't write that any better or any more on the nose. Backstage we see Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell. Steiner is the new leader of the NWO Black and White confronting Conan and saying that the red and black is dead. He also said he promised Luger he wouldn't uh, touch him, but he couldn't say the same thing for Conan. So Conan's very all of a sudden mistrusting like little Luger, you have something you want to tell me. Uh, we wouldn't find out what this meant until a week or two later, which I'll get to in, the, in a little bit. From the very beginning of the show, I feel that every match has gotten incrementally slower since the beginning. When it starts out with big, fast, high-flying cruiser rate stuff, and it just gets slower and slower, with a bit of a pickup near the end, but then slow again. This match is when you really start to see the downturn in terms of like quality and speed. We have a tag team match between Brian Adams and Scott Norton, taking on Fit Finley and Jerry Flynn. When I think of classic Starcade matchups, this one does not end up on the list. It's not a shitty match, but it's not like a great match either. At one point, like, Adams drops Finley with a sloppy looking pile driver. He doesn't even hold on to him as he's sitting down and it's all on Finley to protect himself. It's not a very good looking move. The announcers, I love how they keep bringing up the fact that all four guys have recently worked in the Orient. That's their code for Japan or New Japan specifically because Finley and Flynn just took part in the World Tag League there. Why don't you just call it Japan? You'll have to call it New Japan. But to say the Orient is just so funny. It's just a dated reference for me. That's a pretty hard hitting matchup. There's a lot of cool power moves. Big ol' Haas battle. The hot tag sequence is pretty quick here. Flynn comes in, hits a bunch of kicks on Scott Norton. Vincent, aka Virgil, gets on the apron to distract. He's kicked off, but Norton capitalizes on that. He power bombs uh, Flynn to win the match for the New World Order of Adams and Norton. I give that one match one and a half stars. Uh, like I said, it was kind of a middle of the road match for me. It could have been worse. That that pile driver looked pretty terrible to see, but everything else it was it was it was okay. It was there again. Of all the matches in Starcade, this one is just like eh, like that one and Ernest Miller and Saturn. Like those two just like didn't belong in this card. So earlier we saw Ric Flair cutting a promo on Eric Bischoff, and this time we get the inverse of that. So you have Mean Gene Oakland on the stage, and Eric Bischoff, the WCW president, comes down there to cut a promo with him. And he has such a brilliant heel promo on Flair here. It's so wonderfully skeezy and just so good at getting heat is Eric Bischoff. I mean, he really, you know, it missed his calling. If he were a little bit bigger, a little bit, you know, more muscular, he would have been an amazing heel wrestler. And I think he really fell into this role. And really, I think he did such a good job with this character of being like this ultimate skeezy guy who nobody liked and everyone wanted to see everyone want to see him get beat up and it was a character who would carry on years later in WWE and then TNA I, again it's a perfect character for him I love what he says here because he says Ric Flair is risking his life getting into the ring with me like it sounds like you know in the proper context that's a very intimidating line but the only reason he's saying that is because Flair had a heart attack a coronary earlier so he could die he could get a, a worse one fighting Bischoff Bischoff is not a very intimidating guy so for him to say Ric Flair is risking his life fighting me is a hilarious line come from him and I love this part because he says the only reason Flair is doing this is because he is broke apparently Flair's financial problems were not a secret back then either and so he's just really harping on the fact that Flair doesn't save his money he spends all his money on limousines and Learjets you know I do that but it's on the company's dime so again 
Great heel promo by Bischoff here. TV title on the line as Conan of the NWO Wolfpack defense against Chris Jericho, who's walking down to the ring with the belt, even though it's not officially his. Uh, he lost the belt to Conan one month before, but he stole the belt back, so he's still walking around with the belt as if it's his, but he's technically not the champion at this point. Jericho, of course, coming out with Ralphus, his personal security guard. And Ralphus is a really weird tale. He was he started as, as a truck driver for WCW, and then like as a rib, I guess, they brought him in like to be like this comic relief for Jericho who thinks he needs security, and it's like this dumb looking dude with a half shirt on and that just really that's one of the biggest story I guess you can call it a success story of WCW they got Ralphus over also when you watch Jericho's matches in WCW on the network his theme music is very different it's been dubbed over gone are basketball highlights number 12 like the Pearl Jam sound alike instead it's uh, his first iteration of break the walls down that he came that he debuted with in WWE in 1999 so it's just funny to hear that in its place because it's so not how it actually was originally the match is really good back and forth between the two Jericho hitting all of his greatest hits, you know, the lion salt, the cocky pin, and so on. He goes for a triangle drop kick with Conan on the apron, but Conan ducks, gets out of the way, and directs Jericho right into these steel steps they brought out earlier in the match. And so Jericho takes it right on the ribs, into the steps. Really sick bump by Jericho. Conan at the end shoves the referee lightly, but Billy Silverman sells it like death. That's the first ref bump of the night. It won't be the last. Jericho hits Conan with the belt. K Dog kicks out. Face Buster, Tequila Sunrise. Jericho taps out. So not only does Conan win the match and retain the championship, he keeps Keeps the physical belt as well. I give this one two stars out of four. Great match between these two guys. Good back and forth. Like I said, a very good story told here. In a grudge match, we see Ric Flair taking on the president of WCW, Eric Bischoff. And like I said earlier, that promo package they showed earlier in the night doesn't even touch on the real life personal animosity between the two sides. Because in April of 98, uh, Flair was being sued by the company because he no showed a thunder taping to be at his son Reed's wrestling meet. So Flair was gone. He was persona non grata from April to September of this year gone for a long time. He finally came back once the case was settled. So he comes back and he celebrates the reunion of the Four Horsemen and that's when the Flair-Bischoff rivalry really started taking shape on air. It's worth pointing out that the Four Horsemen, that's Arn and Mongo and Benoit Malenko, are all barred from the building. They will have no part in this matchup. Flair starts out hot, beating the hell out of Bischoff, who of course is totally outmatched and outsized by Flair here. He does have martial arts experience, but of course a wrestler is going to win every time. He's beating up uh, Bischoff in the corner. Referee Charles Robinson pulls him away and that gives Bischoff the opening to do a karate kick to the back of Ric Flair's head to work him over for a bit so he starts getting some heat on Flair but Flair fires back hits him repeatedly in the balls which I guess the referee is allowing because it's right in front of him but I guess hey it's a grudge match so the rules are a little more relaxed fine I'll, I'll accept that but it does make the finish a little more confusing because uh, you know at one point uh, Flair gets Bischoff in the corner he shoves referee Charles Robinson who dies the second ref bump of the night shattered dreams to Eric Bischoff a little shout out to Goldust there who, who started doing that move early in the year. Then you've got a figure four of Bischoff. Kurt Hennig comes down. We had not seen him in a while. He hands Bischoff a foreign object. While the referee's still down, Bischoff decks Flair with the foreign object, covers him. The referee recovers, makes a three count. Bischoff wins the match. If the low blows were not an issue to Robinson, if he were still awake, you know, assuming he's still awake, then nothing would have stopped Hennig from coming down there and handing, you know, the foreign object anyway, because I think Robinson would have allowed it. So that's just, that's logic. That's wrestling logic for you. So Bischoff wins the match. He wins the day here. For a non-wrestler, Bischoff does pretty well here. Gets so much heat. Such a good story. I'm going to give this match one and a half stars out of four. It's not much of a match. It's not very pretty, but the story is there. And again, just the heat that Bischoff gets this whole thing is terrific. And one night after this match, uh, the, the feud was not over here. Because one night after the match, Flair would challenge Bischoff to a rematch with the presidency on the line. Flair would win the match that night on Nitro and become the president for a time before going eventually to the loony bin. And that's a whole other story for a whole other time. In another bit of a grudge match, we have Diamond Dallas Page, the people's champion, taking on the giant of the NWO. The whole basis of this feud started when DDP was defending the U.S. title against Bret Hart several weeks ago, and then Giant comes in and costs him the title with a choke slam. And ever since then, the Giant's been on a huge choke slam spree. It's been choke slam city, bitch. He's been slamming uh, DDP week after week, including off of the Nitro set. So really, DDP doesn't even want to get a shot at the title yet. He just wants a shot at the Giant. And I love Mike Tanay here because he says in the introductions that the DDP has been working on several new variations of the Diamond Cutter to take down the Giant, specifically designed to take down the seven-foot monster. Also, during DDP's entrance, you see Giant sitting on the top turnbuckle waiting for DDP. It looks weird. I don't know what about it. It looks it just it's just weird to see the Giant 
Big Show, whatever you want to call him, sitting on the top turnbuckle for anything, especially just to wait. It's a classic big man, small man matchup here, even though DDP is by no means a small man. Like, he's like 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 and at the time he was built at like 260. So yeah, he's a big dude by wrestler standards, but against the Giant, of course, it's a whole other ball of wax. Uh, Giant's using his size and his strength to manhandle DDP early on with these big bear hugs, tossing him around like he's a rag doll. Really good selling by DDP here. Uh, DDP does fire from a bear hug and tries to sunset flip the Giant, who grabs him by the neck, picks him up, and does a choke slam into a backbreaker. Like, oh my god, that was like a brutal looking move. Page does make a comeback. He tries to cover the Giant, but the Giant pushes him off, and Page just splats right on top of the referee. That is now the third match in a row with a ref bump. Bit of a pattern I'm starting to pick up on here. At that point, Bret Hart, the U.S. champion, runs down with a chair. He goes to hit Page, but he hits the Giant instead. DDP shit cans Bret out of the ring. DDP goes to the top rope. He jumps off, but the Giant catches him, and he wants to do a choke slam. but Page kicks him right in the balls, and the referee who's gotten up at this point doesn't call it. Like, look, I've made this point before when I've reviewed WCW shows, but why is it the referees in this company are so lax? This is not 2000. This is not Vince Russo era where everything's more attitude, bro. This is, you know, 1998. We haven't got to that point yet, but the referees are just so lax and let everything pass. This is like the negative stereotype about how dumb wrestling referees are. Like, cranked to 11. It is bad how the referees are always distracted. They're always getting bumped. They always don't call like blatant low blows. Like what are they thinking? Like it's one thing for no DQ and we'll see that in this match in this, later in the show as well. But it's in, show, in matches that aren't uh, announces no disqualification or whatever, it's like the referees allow it. And it just makes the whole referee position look bad in all of wrestling. So anyway, fine. They don't call the low blow. Uh, DDP is put on the top rope by Giant. He wants to go for a top rope choke slam, but DDP counters it into a super diamond cutter as he's making his way down. So he pins the Giant. He wins. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars. The, the, the dipshittery of the referee aside and the ref bump again, I'm going to look at the story that they have overall, and it's a, a pretty good match. Two and a half stars. I love DDP selling in this. His great story of him overcoming the size of the Giant and finding a way to win. And by the way, the Giant would not be around much longer in WCW because in early February, he would leave the company, then like just days later would debut for the WWF as the Big Nasty, Paul White, coming through the ring in the middle of the main event of Austin McMahon in the cage match the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's how he would debut for the company, and of course he would spend the rest of his career there uh, up until today. In fact, so that was how that was probably one of the last big matches, one of the last big angles of the Giant in his time in WCW. Main event time as Goldberg, the 173 and 0 undefeated champion of WCW, defends his title against Kevin Nash, who won the Battle Royal World War III the previous month to become the number one contender, and that's why they're fighting here tonight. So yes, the biggest world title match we've ever seen in company history, according to Tony Schiavone, is this match right here. Now look at this way. You've got a guy who's still relatively green in Goldberg. He's not going to get much better than this in terms of in-ring ability against a guy in Nash who's famously known for doing only six moves, including the hair flip. So what do you expect from this matchup here? It's a lot of punching and kicking and walking around. There are some slams by Goldberg here but and a couple of takedowns, but really this is not a pretty match. It's not a technical masterpiece. Goldberg hits the spear, goes to the jackhammer, but he hits a low blow, but hey, it's no DQ now, so it's okay. So what justified the other low blows in the previous match is not getting called his disqualification. How many have we seen tonight? So Goldberg slams Nash, then hits him with what I think is like the weirdest looking spin kick I've ever seen in my life. Disco Inferno runs in. Goldberg takes care of him. Bam Bam Bigelow runs in. Goldberg takes care of him. As the referee is distracted trying to get those guys out of the ring, out comes Scott Hall, who's disguised as arena security with a taser. He zaps Goldberg in the chest and the stomach area. Kevin Nash hits the jackknife. Goldberg is still convulsing over the electrocution, and then Nash pins him and becomes the new WCW champion. Okay, if it's no DQ, one, why does the referee give a shit about uh, Disco and B Bigelow? Why is he trying to get them out of the ring? Second of all, Scott Hall never is like, why is he disguised as arena security? Like, he never said he was leaving. He wasn't, like, barred from the arena. There was no reason for him to disguise himself in any capacity. And maybe he, like, beat the guard up and took his taser or something. I just don't understand why that was necessary. That was kind of an extra little layer that didn't really need to happen. So, yeah, Nash is the new champion. I'm going to give this one one star out of four. You know, a few weeks ago, I praised Kevin Nash for his match with Bret Hart at Survivor Series 95. Well, guess what? Goldberg ain't no Bret Hart, and this weren't no Survivor Series 95 street fight. This was pretty hard to watch. It was pretty one-dimensional. I mean, you knew going in what these guys are capable of, so that's kind of the match you got. And so, yeah, it was a little overbooked and con uh, convoluted near the end, and there you go. So the big thing about this moment of Nash winning the championship, of course, one week after this would lead to the finger poke of doom. <laughs> What's that about? What's going on here? 
January 4th, 1999, when Kevin Nash calls out Hulk Hogan, he, uh, he brings him out of retirement and brings him out of his presidential campaign to have a championship matchup. And so Nitro, you see Hogan and Nash, and then uh, Hogan pokes Nash in the chest. Nash takes a big bump and Hogan pins him, becoming the new champion. And while that goes on, before this happens, Tony Schiavone famously gives away the results to the pre-taped Raw, happening at the same time, saying that Mick Foley, mankind, is going to win the world title. Oh, gonna put some butts in the seat. And then what happened was, allegedly, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people immediately changed the channel from Nitro to Raw and just totally turned the tide. And so everyone saw Mick Foley win the title and that was a great moment. Meanwhile, Nitro viewers saw this bullshit happen with Hogan pinning Nash out of the finger poke and that and that, that moment also unified NWO Black and White and the Wolfpack as Nash was the leader of the Wolfpack at the time so yeah, the NWO officially became a big conglomerate of Hollywood and, and Wolfpack, they became a full heel group Conan was kicked out of the group after Lex Luger beat him up, that was the, the foreshadowing brought on earlier by Scott Steiner talking to Conan, so that's where we're at here, is that this match here, the ending Goldberg's undefeated streak and having it end the way it did, in a way it protects him because, you know, you're not going to get it from a taser shot no matter who you are. So he gets pinned and that's his streak. We never see him with the championship again in WCW. And this bullshit comes off with a finger poke of doom and Hogan just putting his ass back into the in the politicking scene in WCW. Like it's, plenty, it's, it's, it's not a good look for WCW. And really, like I said, really turns a tide in favor of the WWF pretty much from then on. But despite all that, I am going to give WCW Starcade 98 a B minus grade. This was actually better than I remember it being or thought that it was going to be. Uh, I I loved Kidman's work in the first two matches of the night. The fact that he worked two full matches was amazing work by him, and just both matches in general were great. So props to Mysterio and Juventud Guerrero and Eddie Guerrero as well. Flair versus Bischoff, you know, the match, it was what it was, but the story was great. I loved the build with the promos and the video package, and the match itself told a great story. Jericho and Conan was a good match. DDP and Giant was also a welcome surprise as well. As far as I didn't like about the show, Ernest Miller and Saturn was just a match that yeah, didn't need to be there. Uh, Goldberg and Nash was not a great main event for the show in general and also just again just the overall tone of referees being completely devoid of intelligence always being distracted always getting beat up you know it's just like a lack of re a lack of enforcement of the rules that you know took me out of it a little bit that was annoying the fact that almost every match had this happen uh very annoying so that's gonna ding it a couple points for me as well you know even though star k 98 was not looked back as fondly critically or historically as the one the year before in 97 there's still a lot to enjoy from this pay-per-view take away the ref bullshit take away gold Goldberg Nash, and you'll have a pretty solid WCW pay-per-view. It really showed like the good and the bad of WCW at that time. Well, that's going to do it for this review, folks. Thanks once again to Adam Vanderplum for nominating this show. If you want to have a hand in determining what classic shows I review in the future, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you will have the opportunity to nominate shows for me to review in future installments. Well, the next classic show I'm reviewing will truly be a classic. Lately, I've been doing some late 90s, early 2000s stuff, but I'm going way back this time. I'm going to the very first Royal Rumble pay-per-view. Not the first Rumble match, because that was on TV. I'm talking about about the Royal Rumble 1989. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.